Here we are again. Good morning. Um, I think I think that the slide is misleading. It can be it can be a mesh without a mess. But Raymond is. I'm sure Raymond the Young uh, from Cilium is going to show us. Is going to prove me wrong. Raymond, thank you. Give it up for him, please. Thank you. Thank Good you. Luck. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Raymond de Jong. I'm Dutch, obviously of my name. Um, I work for Isovalent. Isovalent is the company who originated Cilium. Uh, how many of you know Cilium? Good. How many of you know what eBPF is, or eBPF in general? Cool, good. Um, at Isovalent, I'm field CTO. I'm here happy to present uh, uh, about Cilium, service mesh, without the mesh, and I hope I can explain why that is. So first of all, I want to start for the people who don't know so much about eBPF and Cilium, what these are, um, after which I'm going to talk how C C uh, Service Mesh has evolved, and then look at a few features Cilium Service Mesh is offering today. Um, and hopefully I have time for a small demo so you can see it in action. So eBPF, what is eBPF? Um, eBPF stands for external, ex, ex, Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, that doesn't mean anything. It, it doesn't mean a lot. But how we use it is um, eBPF makes the kernel programmable in a dynamic way. We like to say what JavaScript is to your browser, uh, eBPF is to the kernel. And what that means is that based on kernel events, we can do a number of things with that. So today we're focusing obviously on service mesh, so we're looking at a lot of networking capabilities. That means that, for example, when a process opens a socket, or when a network device sends a packet, or you see TCP retransmissions, those are kernel events where basically we hook eBPF programs to, and that allows us to get rich visibility and access um, to data to provide service mesh capabilities uh, using Cilium. Also on the runtime side, we can also use eBPF to secure workloads and to be able to see, for example, file access processes being executed and secure and enforce there. Cilium uses eBPF to um, basically provide advanced networking capabilities. Today we're looking mostly at distributed applications where service mesh is at play. But you can also use Cilium standalone for high performance load balancing, for example. Using eBPF, we can accelerate the data path using, for example, XDP. So Cilium is a broad solution for networking, observability, and security. This is the 30,000 feet view of what Cilium is able to deliver today. Um, at the base, Cilium has a lot of networking features. Uh, think about plain network policy support, Cilium network policy support, we can do encryption in transit using IPsec and WireGuard. We can provide load balancing east-west with a cube proxy replacement using eBPF. So we're replacing legacy IP tables instead using eBPF maps, which is a lot faster, and meaning that every endpoint's IP is an atomic change instead of a linear list to be replaced in IP tables. Also, multi-cluster capabilities where you can mesh multiple clusters together, getting one unified data plane using Cilium. Um, and finally, we also have you know, things like egress gateway, BGP, overlay networking on the networking side. On top of that, we have an observability layer with Hubble that allows us to get this visibility at layer three, layer four, layer seven to see what's actually going on. So we can see using Hubble, using the UI or using metrics, what service connects to what service, what are return codes, what is the duration of a request, is there latency in TCP and so forth. On top of that is right now Cilium Service Mesh with Gateway API, Ingress, um, where we can support traffic management and uh, are also supporting Gateway API as such. And on the right side, we have Tetragon, which is our runtime solution, which is a session on its own. I won't talk a, a lot about that today. And Cilium can run on any cloud. It can run on-prem, can run on OpenShift. GKE Entos uses Cilium under the hood. Azure is currently adopting Cilium as the de default data plane for AKS clusters. EKS Anywhere uses Cilium by default, and we're hoping that AWS is also switching in the future to, to use Cilium by default as well for EKS clusters. 
Um, and it doesn't matter if it's on-prem or in cloud or both, and you can connect them together using multi-cluster capabilities. So today we'll talk about service mesh. So where did service mesh came from? When looking at distributed applications, we want to see how they perform. So we need observability. We want to see how long a duration uh, is, ta is taking. We want to see the return codes. We want to effectively troubleshoot it. We also want to secure it either in transit, and we also want to do authentication. Perhaps we want to use MTLS to authenticate services talking to each other. We also want to do layer seven traffic management, perhaps. We want to do path redirection or TLS decryption and such. And finally, we want resilience. We want to have availability um, across clusters, even across clouds if possible. So where service mesh obviously started was with binaries, right? Applications were having code to provide that kind of capabilities. At scale, that doesn't work. It's hard to maintain. You need to maintain all those binaries and libraries yourself. Um, and therefore, we moved to a service mesh with a sidecar proxy model where all those capabilities were moved to the sidecar proxy instead, ma making sure that the application itself doesn't have to maintain all these libraries and making the development of that application easier. Obviously, the sidecar proxy has capabilities on layer four and layer seven load balancing, but it also has a few downsides, as you may have known. So we're moving from a shared model to a sidecar model, and with Cilium, we're moving to a kernel model, meaning that we want to bring um, all these service mesh capabilities as close to the kernel as we can using eBPF. So today, the only thing which is not yet there is layer seven, mostly. Um, we already, for a, a few years already, support the layer two, layer three, layer four capabilities in kernel using Cilium, using eBPF. For example, the east-west load balancing I just mentioned, using a queue proxy replacement, that's done through eBPF instead of IP tables. So layer seven, and there was also a question this morning, eBPF has uh, limitations, right? And that's for good reason. That it runs in kernel, right? So you have to have constraints and limitations of what you are allowed to do. And today, for example, something like HTTP uh, path redirection or TLS decryption as such is cost too much of code and processing to do in eBPF today. But it might happen in the future, but that's the reason why layer seven is not yet there. Although Cilium already has all these layer seven capabilities, we already see, for example, using network policies, we can enforce traffic on the API layer. We can see HTTP calls, methods, return codes. We can load balance and route gRPC. We can observe traffic using Grafana and Hubble UI. So Cilium already has these capabilities, and we're extending these capabilities using service mesh. So how does Cilium service mesh then look like? For starters, if you run Cilium as a CNI, Cilium runs as a daemon set, meaning that the Cilium agent runs on each node. And what we're doing here is that we use Envoy embedded in that agent on that node for proxy-like capabilities and enforcement and observability like layer seven to be able to enforce, for example, HTTP requests. When Cilium is installed, and depending on the configuration you set, Cilium makes sure that the right eBPF programs are mounted on the nodes and are being able to execute it when you need them. So when you enable metrics, that happens under the hood. You don't need to be an eBPF expert to actually run Cilium. Um, eBPF does its magic under the hood. So what happens with service mesh? So as soon as you trigger or enable a service mesh capability, that means that on the node for that given namespace, we create a listener. So Envoy has specific listeners in a namespace context to do layer seven load balancing or path redirection, for example. And how is this different compared to uh, other service meshes? Well, first of all, we want to reduce operational complexity. We want to make it easier you already need a CNI, you may mo most likely perhaps already use Cilium, and you can just enhance Cilium by enabling service mesh, and you don't need an external an ingress or gateway API controller. Also goal is to reduce, reduce uh, resource usage. So having not running sidecars means that you will save a lot of resources in your cluster. It will provide better performance for a number of reasons. And we want to avoid sidecar shutdown, startup, uh, latency, or race conditions. 
So let's dive in on a few of those use cases. If we look at the resource usage, obviously with sidecars, you have for each spot where you enable, or each surface where you enable uh, um, um, surface mesh for, you will have a sidecar running. That means that at scale, this means a lot of memory, a lot of CPU, and also a lot of TCP IP connections being tracked for those sidecars. So that will cost resources. Moving that to the kernel frees up a lot of resources. Obviously, um, um, it's not free, and, but using eBPF where we can and centralizing resources as efficient as possible will save you a lot of resources in the end. There's also another cost of sidecar injection, and that is the induced latency when using sidecars. So when you see this diagram, an app is trying to send traffic to another app or service, that basically means that it goes three times through the TCP IP stack, once sending the packet, then receiving on the sidecar side, processing it in the sidecar, then sending the packet on the wire. And the same happens on the destination again. And you can see this loop takes time, and that will induce latency. How we solve this using eBPF, and this is already there for years, is that using eBPF, we can direct, directly forward traffic from the socket layer to the, to the NIT network interface um, without traversing this TCP IP stack. So this is an example where we only need layer three or layer four load balancing. We don't need to go through the proxy, um, and we can directly do, using a queue proxy replacement, do our load balancing and send it on the wire. In case we need layer seven uh, processing, then we need to redirect it to the proxy, yes, on the node, but we do it through the socket layer. So we're avoiding this TCP IP stack and directly forward it to the proxy and once the proxy has done his, his, its job, it will forward it to the data plane. This improves latency a lot. In our measurements, two, three, and sometimes four times, depending on what you use, if you use a lot of network policies or a lot of uh, uh, layer seven path redirections. Here you can see it compared to Istio-based implementation, avoiding this loop on your TCP IP stack uh, improves performance a lot, and it also improves throughput. Uh, slightly, and also a thing to consider is that obviously at scale, when you're scaling out your applications, that also means with a sidecar implementation that you have to wait for that sidecar to be ready to receive connections to be able to process your service and be able to serve your application. With Cilium Service Mesh, that agent runs on the node, it's ready to receive connections, it creates a listener, and it's happy to serve connections uh, when it needs to. So today, Cilium Servers Mesh can do a number of things. Traffic management is first for layer seven, traffic management, path redirection, which, what we are looking uh, at today. Observability using Hubble, you can export metrics to Grafana, which gives you visibility of performance of your application. Enforcing security through Cilium network policies, by itself, it's already there for years, and now using Service Mesh, we can extend that capability, and resilience through, um, uh, for example, cluster mesh topologies and such. We're not planning to develop a control plane on our own, so you can use ingress resources or gateway AP API resources. Um, Spiffy is on the roadmap. Um, we already have the data plane ready, but the control plane needs to be developed as such. And for power users today, we can also do and, 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 yeah, advanced Envoy uh, custom resource definitions, um, but with Gateway API, my, um, my um, vision is that you don't need that anymore. On the observability side, you can hook up, obviously, Prometheus, Grafana, you can instrument your applications using OpenTelemetry. Using eBPF, we can export those metrics in the most efficient way as possible, and obviously, you can export flows and data to seam platforms at Fluid D or Elasticsearch. Now, if you want to get started with Cilium, you have two choices. Uh, maybe you already have a sidecar implementation based on Istio. I strongly encourage to also run uh, Cilium on those clusters because when you look, for example, at the sidecar implementation and you're thinking about MTLS between sidecars for authentication, authorization purposes, what a lot of people don't know is that the actual connection between the sidecar and the actual pod as a destination is unencrypted. Using Cilium, because we shortcut this connection on layer four, 
we avoid that this connection is actually going through a virtual interface and no one can listen to that traffic. So already there's a benefit if you have an Istio-based implementation to run Cilium. And obviously if you're creating new clusters, then you can just start with Cilium and enable the ingress controller and gateway API and you're ready to go. So last year we released Cilium 1.12, which meant that we uh, released a production-ready Cilium service mesh with uh, a Cilium ingress controller, uh, conformant using uh, Kubernetes ingress controller resources. Um, you can use Kubernetes as your control plane, simple as that. We already have Prometheum, Prometheus metrics, Grafana dashboards, and for power users, the Cilium cluster envoy config or Cilium envoy config. And Last week, we released Cilium 1.13, which enabled a uh, gateway API with uh, uh, HTTP routing, TLS termination, traffic splitting, and header modification. The data path for MTLS is ready. It's not yet really usable, but what, it, what you can expect is that you can use Cilium network policies to enforce, for example, spiffy IDs as source and destinations to allow that authentication. We have a shared load balancer for ingress resources, which I will talk a bit today as well. Layer 7 load balancing for Kubernetes services with annotations, so plain cluster IP services you can use um, for load balancing purposes. And a IPAM solution for load balancer services and BGP advertisement. In the cloud, don't, you don't need it, but if you run on-prem, you most likely need to connect your load balancer IPs to the network or advertise them through BGP. This makes it really easy and flexible to advertise multiple pools of IPs to your network. So let's have a look on the features. So for starters, ingress. Um, this is just following the Kubernetes ingress spec. Um, you don't need an e external ingress controller. And what you will notice is that you need to specify an ingress class name as Cilium. Um, you need to enable Cilium on, on the Helm charge, which I will look a bit uh, later on as well. Um, and that's basically it. You can do path redirection in this example to forward traffic to a specific service. And this is a common example where we have a uh, book info application where we, for example, forward the, the default URL to the product page and the details URL to a uh, specific service for that purpose. We can also do ingress for gRPC, so we can specifically forward traffic from specific GRPC calls to specific services. And we can also do TLS termination using, for example, a secret you have created to do the TLS decryption at the ingress and then forward it to the services. We also release the shared load balancer for ingress resources. This makes a lot of sense in terms of cost savings. If you run in the cloud, or let's say if you, if you want to use ingress or gateway API, you need to have some kind of load balancing solution. Cilium can do it out of the box for on-prem solutions, and then the IPs don't cost you a lot of money, I suppose, but in cloud, it does. So uh, if you run an uh, EKS and you create a uh, Cilium uh, ingress resource, that basically means that under the hood it creates a load balancer in EKS with a public IP, and obviously that costs money. If you have multiple ingress resources, they will have uh, previously each one will have a dedicated load balancer, but with Cilium 1.13, you can specify it as shared using an annotation, and then you can have a shared single load balancer to do have a lot of ingresses running on top of that. Then Gateway API. And yesterday there was an excellent session uh, by uh, Ara Puyuyo, 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 sorry, <laughs> um, about Gateway API. In general, Cilium already supports Gateway API, so, um, um, we can have gateway API resources, HTTP routes. Um, you can attach multiple HTTP routes to a given gateway API resources, and Cilium, in that sense, is a gateway class. How that looks like is instead of, uh, if, if you on the look on the left, we specify a gateway resource of gateway class Cilium, and then you create one or multiple listeners for the specific gateway. And then you attach HTTP routes where you specify the parent gateway to link it to that specific gateway. And then you can do, for example, path matching and redirects as such. Looking at TLS termination, we also support SNI, so you can have multiple host names, with, uh, with multiple listeners with different host names. Um, so in this case, we have the book info.cilium.rocks, and we reference the secret for TLS termination 
and the HTTP route will forward it to the required services. Traffic splitting is also supported, so you can um, do canary releases, blue-green releases as such, so you can slowly introduce traffic into new services using HTTP routes um, for, for, for the Gateway API solution. What we also enabled is layer seven load balancing for cluster IP Kubernetes services with simple annotations um, without sidecars. So that means that you can specify that annotation on a given service as shown here, and you label it as service.cilium.io label uh, lb-lc7 enabled. That enables that feature and then you can specify an algorithm. So in this case, least request, but we also support round robin or random. Um, and this allows you to, for example, on a service level, low balance gRPC or HTTP traffic um, as such. This is also compatible with cluster mesh. So cluster mesh allows you to have two or more clusters together to create a single Cilium identity aware data plane on top of that. You can use service mesh in those clusters. You can use, for example, ingress or gateway API to attract traffic inwards your cluster. But then you will forward it to a service, and using this service, you can also decide, I want this specific service to be high available across clusters. So additionally, the layer seven load balancing capabilities, we can also load balance it across clusters. So super flexible and powerful, you can mix and match both ingress gateway API resources with service resources and low balance where you need them to be. And finally, observability. So we're partnering with Grafana. That means that we are creating, uh, as of today, as we speak, a lot of new dashboards. You may already be aware of the day two operational dashboards we have already available on the Grafana marketplace to monitor and to uh, see how your cluster is behaving but we're expanding these dashboards to provide meaningful layer seven golden signal metrics based dashboards. And those data is using, is exported through eBPF and we are also exporting to capabilities in Grafana such as Mimir, Loki and Tempo. Tempo, so if you instrument your application using open telemetry, using eBPF, we can extract that data and we can export it to Tempo, where you will see the traces and you can see exemplars and how the different specific span is taken. And this is one dashboard. Um, this can be a session on its own as well, but what we're here seeing here, without sidecars, using Cilium Service Mesh, we're already able to see HTTP codes. We're already able to see latency. We can see request duration. We can see uh, we can detect latency as such. And this is without any sidecar, without instrumentation of your application. It's already there because we have this layer seven visibility with network policies and with Hubble metrics. That also means that we already have visibility on the network layer. If you think your application is performing fine, we also have this visibility in the network layer where we can see how many bytes are sent, we can see retransmissions, and we can also see the round trip, round, round trip time perhaps being increasing, which can point to a specific network issue or a specific node issue. So I hope I have a little bit time for a small demo um, to show how this actually looks like in for real. So I hope in the back, I checked it a bit, it's readable in the back. Good. So how to get started with Cilium? Let me just show an example. I'm running this demo on GKE. So what you need to do is you need to enable an ingress controller if you want to use the ingress resource using Cilium. Optionally, you can enable the Hubble metrics. So I have a lot of examples here. This is all documented. You can find all these examples there. But what I'm wanting to show and what I'm wanting to see is DNS, drops, TCP, HTTP traffic. And for service mesh, what's important is that you also enable gateway API enabled equals true. And finally, the queue proxy replacement. This setting has to be set to, str to strict or partial. We do recommend strict. That has the best compatibility and performance for your clusters. Then I already mentioned it a bit. Then you can create gateway resources. So this is a simple example of a gateway resource, the book info example and the HTTP routes. So 
now you see my environment where I'm running LGKE. I'm hopefully I have connection still. It's it's a bit late delaying. Let me see. Yeah, so I'm in the book info namespace. I'm doing a, a, a kubectl get services. So here I can see I already created the the, the gateway. Uh, I can also do uh, kubectl get gateways. This should be able, yeah. So I have a book info HTTP and HTTPS gateway, and I get a public IP from GKE to reach it from the outside world. Um, on the side of the application, I also have this HTTP route, so I have the details path forwarding to the details service, and the default path forwarding to the product page. So using the public IP, I should be able to connect to it. Yes, I can. And if I go to, oops, if I go to slash details, details, I should be able to query a specific um, entry, as I can see here. I also created an HTTPS example. What you obviously need to do is create a secret. I've installed that secret in my namespace, and I'm referencing that secret as well. Um, and it's called a demo cert. Then on the HTTP route side, I just specify the book info.cilium.rux and forward it again to my specific services. So that means that if I refresh this on HTTPS, I've installed this certificate on my laptop as well, so I trust it as such. So the connection is secure, and going to <coughs> this seems to work as well. So that's great. And finally, as a quick example, I want to show a blue-green gateway. So in this example, you do a blue-green deployment or canary release using weights. Again, you create a, a gateway. Uh, in this case, it listens for the host name myapp.cdmrocks, also with the secret, and an HTTP route where I specify that for 80% or 90% in this case, for my, I want to forward traffic to the blue service, and for 10%, I want to forward traffic to my green service. So let's see if that's working. So I first need to change my namespace to the blue-green. Then I should be able to see that currently most of my requests are to my blue service. All right. Let's say I want to introduce more traffic to my green service. That means that I can just simply edit the weights, save it, and then apply the new configuration. That's configured. And hopefully, we can now see, yes, more green services are responding to my request. So very easy to use, out of the box using Cilium, um, without any external ingress or gateway API controller, um, using eBPF to forward traffic uh, as such. Back to the slides. All right. So that concludes my demo and my presentation for today. Um, if you want to know more and try it out yourself, feel free to go to Cilium.io. There's a lot of getting started guides, also with the documentation about Service Mesh, Gateway API, with examples you can try, try out yourself. Um, join us on the Cilium.slack.com channel if you have questions or feature requests or would like to participate or le learn more. What's also great is on the isofaden.com forward slash labs URL, um, you will see that there are a lot of labs available, including Gateway API and Service Mesh Labs, so you can try this out yourself. It's based on Instruct, so you get a dedicated VM with a kind cluster on top of it, and you can see uh, Cilium and test it out. You can even debug things if you like. If you want to know more on eBPF, feel free to uh, go to eBPF.io. And obviously, if you want to know more about Azure Valent and what we're working on, or want to look for uh, career opportunities, please go there, and uh, we're hiring, so have a, have a look there. And uh, uh, feel free to ask me any questions you like, and I'm happy to, to stay around. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raymond. Okay. It, was, it was extremely interesting. Cool. Um, before we open up for questions, are you OK to take some questions, Raymond? Mm -hmm. Before we Absolutely. open up for Raymond, um, I would like to two two service uh, informations. We have uh, Amasur, 
on site, so you can get a massage, is uh, in the sponsor area. No? Okay. <laughs> nah, but <yeah>. thanks. <laughs> um, the, the second one is we're going to have a, some Q&A with Raymond. Afterwards, we are going to have a little break and lunch. So you, have, you guys have some time to stretch your legs and to speak with our great sponsors. Please speak with them. The lunch is going to be served in the sponsor area. Um, and uh, that's it. We're going to restart with a person that is actually very, very dear to me. Uh, my, brad, my brother, Luconde, uh, is going to start a quarter to two here. Now, questions for Raymond. Hey. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you regarding the possibility of the multi-cluster, because you show that there is an option to set up the global, but uh, I don't really get, like, how do you do that? Do you have a separate installation for Cinium outside the clusters, connected to multiple clusters? How do you do that? Yeah, so uh, first of all, you need to meet a few requirements. So let's say you're running uh, two clusters on AKS in different zones or regions, whatever, and you want to connect them. You need to have layer-free connectivity between them, either through gateway or, or through VPN. And so the nodes can reach each other and that the API server is available in each cluster to listen to requests, read-only requests from another cluster. Once you've done that, you can either use the Cilium CLI or specific Helm values to enable cluster mesh. And what it looks like is that you basically create a unique ID in each cluster. Uh, uh, you will specify the main CA to, send, uh, to sign certificates for the agents to have TLS connectivity with each other. And then they will be meshed, right? So the CLI is super easy to use, but we also have documentation how you can use that with Helm. And then basically, um, there's one data plane. One cluster learns from the identities from the other cluster and the way around. And when you create global services in each cluster in the same namespace, Cilium under the hood using eBPF will populate load balancing eBPF maps with those IPs of endpoints and will load balance traffic across um, through the nodes to the other nodes and then forward it to the destination pod, for example. So super easy to use in that sense. So the documentation uh, is out there and should be self-explanatory uh, as such. Uh, first of all, thank you for a great talk about the very comprehensive description of the novel service mesh approach. I, I have a small question because you, you mentioned uh, that there are several quirks that one has to take into account when deploying uh, the service mesh. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the environment that you would re uh, recommend in order to try, try out the service mesh, for example, to compare with the other solutions like Istio or Linkerd uh, without having to deal with quirks uh, of the uh, deployments of, let's say, uh, cloud providers? So you can try it on kind clusters, if you liked, on your laptop or Minikube. Um, with, with kind, you may need some M Metal LB uh, implementation, or you can use the Cilium built-in low, low balancing capability to try it out yourself. Uh, you can also perhaps run a little cluster on VMs, install Cilium. You don't, you just need a specific, you don't just need a 4.9 plus kernel. So if it's Debian or Ubuntu, doesn't matter. You create a small cluster, install Cilium with the, the Helm values I just shown, uh, and that would, would set you ready to use service mesh as such. And again, on-prem, you will need this load balancer. So you should enable the Cilium load balancer to be able to allocate IPs to attract and attach the load balancer to your ingress resources as such. So I recommend to, to check out this lab. We have a gateway API lab and a service mesh lab. You can also earn a badge when you complete it. Um, and this lab runs kind on instruct VMs. So you can actually see it working without trying to run anything in a cloud or whatsoever. Thank you. You're welcome. OK, do you hear me correctly? I do. OK. Hey, <laughs> thank you, by the way. It's a nice product. Um, but now I've got some questions, and I'm not trying to critique you here. But uh, uh, you talked about uh, uh, the sidecar uh, solution and that this is an alternative. Yeah. Um, and then you showed the performance uh, uh, improvement in latency. But then the showing us the throughput, it didn't relate very much. Can you explain that? 
Well, um, can I explain it? I mean, um, you get a little bit of benefit of um, the TCP socket layer connectivity through the sidecar, but you still have to get the throughput on the, the, the same TCP stack leaving the, the host. So that's limited perhaps by speed or as such. So you don't gain a lot there, uh, but it has small gains for sure. Um, so yeah, Th that's, that's my explanation perhaps. Okay, that could be a thing. Yeah. But the thing in my mind here is mm -hmm. the BPF itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you will see a lot of applications that start using it. Silim is an example yeah. of that. Um, in Kubernetes, we've got something like the, the OOP um, eh, that kicks in if your CPU is, is getting used. Mm -hmm. um, in your kernel, this is not really tracked. Could this not be a vulnerability in the fact that if there's common, is a lot of traffic in a node, yeah. how would we see that? So I reckon if psyllium is, is, is a limiting factor there. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so one best practice is not to um, constrain psyllium and psyllium agents as such running on a node using yeah. resource pools, etc. Don't do that because that will at some point break it. But obviously if you push more traffic, if you do more load balancing, yes, of course you will see an increase of CPU being used. Um, you can track it, however, using our already available psyllium dashboards using Grafana, for example, and you can see how an agent is performing. You can see if there's BPF map pressure or if you're running out of um, uh, memory or CPU on the node level. So you can already use those metrics and those capabilities built in to monitor the performance of your nodes of Cilium and your cluster. In load, yeah, okay, well, I was <laughs> It could not be that it, ev that's if, I if, if it happens mm -hmm. in user land, mm -hmm. that's nice. But if, if your kernel, because all the processing in the kernel, no priority goes straight to, mm -hmm. uh, it could be your breaking point. Yeah, yeah that's, that's one reason why we also um, launched Tetragon, because we can also y use Tetragon in combination with Cilium to do the kernel visibility. So. That's next level, I would say. Um, it's not something I yet see implemented all as such, but we can actually monitor BPF calls and BPF and kernel as events at such and as the performance using Tetracon. Um, but that's, that's an, an another solution you need to run on top of that. Are you okay to take two Absolutely. more questions? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Keep them coming. All right, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, okay. um, <laughs> Amazon has its pretty uh, specific VPC uh, CNI with Correct. all the IP juggling. Uh, can CDM integrate with that or even replace it? Any yes. Pitfalls there? You, you have a choice here. Um, first of all, you can use Cilium as VPC CNI chaining mode. That means that you leave AWS for IP allocation, the ENI allocation to the, to the EKS nodes and some other IP related things. And on top of that, Cilium can do the enforcement using network policies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you can use service mesh capabilities as well. But you can also deploy, provision your clusters in EKS or AKS or GKE still with bring your own CNI or with specific flags not to provision the A AWS CNI and then, then install Cilium yourself. And then you have the full feature set available uh, and compatible running on EKS. Uh, Raymond, I have one more question, yeah. and then I have a question of my own, if you don't mind. That's fine, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, my question is, um, so in the proxy-based service mesh, uh, we as a user get to see which applications use service mesh. Yeah. So only those part, parts of only those applications uh, will get the sidecar inserted. In this case, it is at kernel level. Yeah. Does it mean that we lose that flexibility and whether or not we want it for one or the other application sitting on the node, it gets applied to all of them? No. And if that is the case, then what about the performance? No, it's not the case. Um, so it's only the case for, let's say, this specific service when you enable this layer seven load balancing in a given namespace. That will mean that only for this given namespace, we create this Envoy listener on the node, on the agent, um, but not for everyone else, right? So it's dependent on where you enable it. Um, so it just unlocks this ingress controller and gateway API 
controller, you can use it, but on only if you specify it either in as an ingress resource, gateway API resource, or use the load balancing service cluster IP annotation. Then it will use it, not, not, not before that. Uh, Raymond. Yes. First of all, I would like to congratulate you and Cilium team for uh, 2,101 commits for release 113. <laughs> Thank you. That was impre <laughs> impressive. Yes. It's packed with goodies. Um, I have played with Cilium, and I still implemented the customers a lot. And the, uh, I have tried out, I've tried out the cluster mesh uh, mm -hmm. with two uh, clusters only. What I miss is a, a single pane of glass on Hubble, and a third something that allows me to uh, observe the service mesh into one place. Is in the same look and feel that Cilium always gives, like everything. Mm -hmm. Butter is included. Mm -hmm. Is that in the planning? Well, um, that's a tricky question in the sense that we do have it available as an enterprise uh, Hubble UI. So, yes, Hubble UI is limited to what you see. You can see the identities from different clusters. You can see, um, you can secure it as such, right? You can use the cluster ID as a source or destination in Cilium network policies. But the visibility layer is in the Hubble UI enterprise uh, solution. Well, that, thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Um, I have the feeling that it was very interesting for all the people that are still sitting here, still uh, looking at you. I don't know if they, <laughs> if they want to find you in the back room to That's eat fine. you or something else. <laughs> but, uh, but thank you very much, Raymond. Thank you it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, guys. Uh, you are free. You are always free. But you chose not to be. So... <laughs> We're going, we're going to see each other later for a look on this talk at 1.45. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>